Good morning. Welcome to you. Happy to have you all here this morning. Got a question. Are you ready for Christmas? No. No? Well, that's the name of the sermon this morning. Are you ready for Christmas? Please turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter 1. It's just before chapter 2. It's just after Matthew chapter 1. I'm going to start reading in verse 18. <coughs> God's word says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with the child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought in these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of by the Lord, by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife. And he knew her not until she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. <clears throat> Have you ever thought, thought about what it means when they say they've had a medical breakthrough? Usually it means they think you found, maybe finally found, the answer to a medical problem of some type or other. At least they're going in the right direction in, towards solving the problem. There's other kinds of breakthroughs also. For example, Christmas time. In 1944, the Germans tried for a giant breakthrough of the American lines in Belgium. Praise the Lord, they failed. Or, or it might have changed the whole world, and I might be speaking in German. I guess you could say that the breakthrough is that the Germans didn't have a breakout. That's a breakthrough. Now here's another breakthrough that really changed the world forever. It happened very quietly one night, and the news wasn't reported on TV or radio or even in the newspapers. It happened about 2,000 years ago when God came to earth. God had tried to reach the inhabitants of the earth for a very long time, and he'd done it in a lot of different ways. Remember, Jesus isn't a man, nor are his ways our ways. He doesn't do things the way we do. Isaiah 55, 8 through 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So God has spoken to us through nature. He spoke to us through man's conscience. He spoke through men. He spoke through men, his prophets. But the biggest breakthrough to the hardness of a man's heart came when the Lord Jesus took the form of a baby, baby Jesus. God came to earth in the form of a man so that people could have a right relationship with God. Because of the fall, men did not have a right relationship with God, and God tried numerous ways. The 
And he knew that men were sin, all men were sinners. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, is what the Bible tells us. We're born sinners. We never had to commit the first sin. When we were born, we're born not loving God. The greatest commandment is to love the Lord the God with all thy heart and all thy soul and all thy mind. And we're born not loving God. I've got two kids. You've not met my son, but you met my daughter here just last week. When my daughter was born, she was just a little baby. I mean, an innocent, you know, a little baby. She wasn't innocent. But you know what? She never had to tell the first lie. She never had to cry and scream saying she was hungry when she wasn't. Or she never had to do anything. She was born not loving God. When she was born, the only thing she was interested in was her mom or her dad holding her and keeping her warm and feeding her. That's the only thing she was interested in. That's what she loved, being held and being, being fed. And that's all babies are that way. They're born not loving God. It's a result of sin entering into the world. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. God says that sin has to be paid for. And the only thing that can pay for it is blood. Not good works, or not doing this or doing that. Not anything except blood. And it has to be life's blood. But it has to be perfect blood. You see, the, the blood of goats, the blood of cattle, the blood of chickens, the blood of any living creature is not good enough. It has to be perfect blood. And that's why God, the only perfect one, had to become a man in order to shed his blood because God of spirit in heaven has no blood to shed. God had to become a man when he promised Abraham 2,000 years before Christ ever came to this earth, he promised Abraham that he would provide the sacrifice. Abraham didn't quite comprehend it. and he, I'm sure that he thought it was going to happen while he was alive. It didn't happen for 2,000 years yet. But he just believed God that God would do it, and that belief was accounted unto him for, for uh, righteousness. And here we are 2,000 years later, and our belief that Jesus shed his lifeblood, God, whose eternity lives in heaven, came to this earth in order to take on a man and shed his blood, and he did it. He paid the penalty for our sins. You see, there's what's called a trinity. God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Ghost. And I can't explain it. I can give you a rudimentary understanding because I don't have much more than a rudimentary understanding. And I've been studying this for years and years and years. And I don't think any man can comprehend the trinity completely. But I'm going to give you a rudimentary, really, really rudimentary example. You have... You all know what computers are. You have a computer. That computer sits on your desk. You can touch it. You can feel it. But that computer is absolutely useless sitting there on your desk. Why, not? Why is that? Because it's only one part of three. It's not plugged in. It has no power. Like the Holy Spirit. The God, the, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. God the Son is like the body, the part of the computer you can touch. You plug it in and give it power. That's like the Holy Spirit, the power. In the, the program, the, the smarts, the, the intelligence is, is like God the Father. Not to say that God the Holy Spirit isn't intelligent. He is all three. He's, he's intelligent uh, and, he, and he has power. And, God, and Jesus Christ, God, God the Father in heaven, and God the Holy Spirit are spirits. They have no blood. So God became a man. Jesus Christ came to this earth, the part you can touch, the body, in order to shed his blood to pay the penalty for sin. Because God made it that perfect blood has to be shed to pay for sin. And that's why God had to leave heaven to take on the form of a man. And that's why Christmas came here because that's when Jesus came to this earth and took on the form of a man. But he came here for one purpose. He came here not to condemn the world, but he came here to 
saved the world through his shed blood. He came, when he was born, though he was a babe, he was God in, in fullness. He was God in fullness as a babe. And he knew that he would shed his blood. He knew that he would die. That's what he came here for, to pay for our sins. And God made it so that it's so easy for salvation. In order to have his blood applied to our sins, all we have to do is believe over and over and over and over. In the Bible, it says, believe, and thou shalt be saved. Believe. It doesn't say work. It doesn't say go and knock on a thousand doors and tell others of me. We do that kind of stuff because we trusted in Christ. We want to see others saved, but that's not part of getting us to heaven. The part that gets us to heaven is believing who Jesus is, and that applies his shed blood to us, to our sins. So, we have the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, the body, and God the Holy Spirit. Now, when sin entered into the world through Adam and Eve, that spirit, that eternal spirit was taken from man. Man became a dichotomy after that. He became a body and soul. No spirit. And not until he trusts in Christ, the instant he trusts in Christ, that spirit moves within. That spirit becomes, it makes us complete. We, we become again like, like God uh, in, in, in body, soul, and spirit. We're not gods, no way, not even close. But we're like God because we, remember when he said, let us make man in our image? Who was he talking to? He said, let us make man in our image, us. Who was he talking to? Us in our image. He wasn't talking to the angels. He was talking to himself. He was talking to the Trinity. And that's how he made man. Man was originally made body, soul, and spirit. The way God is. Body, soul, and spirit. And then because of the fall, man became body and soul, no spirit. And not until we trust in Christ do we kind of complete again. A trichotomy. We're born in dichotomies ever since the fall. But we become a trichotomy, body, soul, and spirit, once we trust in Christ. Matthew 3, 16 through 17. Um, this is the first time in the whole Bible where you see the whole Trinity all together. At one time, you can see them. You see different places where there's two parts or, or one part but you see distinctly the whole trinity right here in this, in this passage. This is Matthew chapter 3, verse 16 to 17. Remember that there's a test at the end. We should all know this. Verse 16, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So there's Jesus Christ having just been baptized, the body. The Holy Spirit descends and lights on him. That's two parts of the Trinity. And God the Father speaking from heaven. That's the whole Trinity. The Trinity, the eternal Trinity. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. <clears throat> Jesus, that man, is the only way to get to God. Jesus broke down the barriers so that we can be saved. When someone asks Jesus to forgive, us, to forgive his sins and come to his heart, you might consider that that's a breakthrough, too. We're talking about breakthrough. So when a person asks Jesus to save him, that's a breakthrough. That is the greatest individual great breakthrough for anybody in the world. Listen, I've been married for almost 52 years to this lady that I met when I was 12 years old in the church. We were going together since we were 14 years old. We kind of know each other. And I really love her a lot. I even love her more today than I did yesterday. More all the time. It's an amazing thing. And that was a great thing in my life. The greatest thing in my life 
outside of trusting in Jesus Christ for salvation that the Lord has given you. The greatest thing is our eternal salvation when we trust in Christ. <clears throat> so, everybody here this morning is one of two things. You've trusted in Christ, you have eternal life, you're eternal, or you've not trusted in Christ, and you're not eternal, but you're going to spend eternity in a place that's not even made for you. It's made for Satan and all the fallen demons. Hell. We're going to spend one, some place for all eternity there. One of those two places. The key is, has Jesus made that breakthrough in your life? Have you trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? So each person here has some kind of an attitude towards Jesus Christ. I hope that every person here, their attitude is that they're trusting in him for eternal salvation, that they trust in him for what he came to this earth for 2,000 years ago. Why do we have Christmas when he came to this earth? I suspect that everybody here at least has the attitude that he existed, that Jesus existed, and taught good things, or you wouldn't be here to begin with. So with Christmas nearly on us right now, I guess the big question is, are you ready for Christmas? Are you ready for this time we celebrate when God became a man and came to this earth? You know, we need to have the proper attitude. <clears throat> Some of the first tools that I learned of in the Marine Corps were attitude alignment tools. That was in 1967. They were used extensively. And I went through, when I went through infantry training, and thereafter, our company commander, he kept saying, attitude check. To all the Marines, attitude check. We found out that the only proper answer was excellent to outstanding, sir. That was the only proper answer. If you, had a, if you didn't have that answer, then you probably wouldn't even get paid. Because I remember, we used to have a table. The, uh, Tame Asher would come in, and there'd be a, a staff sergeant there, at least a staff sergeant, uh, with a pistol. And all the money laid out, the Tame Asher was sitting at the table, and the company commander was standing right back there. And everybody was standing in line, we'd go up there, and they'd look at your name and they'd divvy out the money. A lot of it was in $2 bills. We used to get paid in $2 bills. And you know, they'd divvy this out. And every time we'd get up there, you'd look and the, and the company commander would say, how's your attitude, Marine? Excellent to outstanding, sir. If it wasn't, I wouldn't get paid. <laughs> You know, that was my response. Even though the, the treatment sometimes was brutal. Sometimes it was just brutal. And the training was harsh. And the food was really, really bad. The worst chow hall I ever ate at was at Camp Gagar Chow Hall there at Camp Lejeune. Worst chow hall. I mean, when I can tell you stories about that. That's the worst chow hall I ever ate at stateside, I'll say. Not stateside, yeah. yeah. <coughs> Um, so we either ate chow and that chow hall came gugger or we ate sea rations. Sea rations were better. <clears throat> sea rations was acceptable. So your attitude towards someone is truly a window of your feelings toward them. There's various attitudes that I want to bring to you now about the attitudes towards Christ. You need to have the proper attitude towards Christ, not necessarily about the chow hall or whatever, but the one towards Christ, that's the one that really makes a difference. The innkeeper, there in Bethlehem, no room. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. No room. The innkeeper had the attitude of no room for Jesus. Boy, there's a lot of people in the world. 
like that to have no room for Jesus. How about Herod? He had the attitude of opposition in Matthew 2.16. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, he was exceeding wroth and went forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem. And in all the coasts thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. So we have the attitude of uh, Herod is the attitude of opposition and the attitude of the innkeeper of no room. But the priests, what was their attitude? They had the attitude of indifference. Matthew 2, 4 through 6 shows us that. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded to them where Christ to be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, art not the least art not the least among the princes of Judea, of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. So they had an indifferent attitude. But how about Simeon, the old man, the, the old man that worked with the priest. He he had attitude to being ready. Luke chapter two verses twenty five through thirty two it says, And behold there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and on this that uh for our candlelight service in the front of that is a picture of Simeon in the temple there holding the, the Christ. Well it's it's a painted, it's a rendition, it's not the Lord came at a time when they didn't have cameras. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was re revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. You're not ready for Christmas unless you have the proper attitude towards Christ. A Savior is born, it tells us in Luke 2. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Messiah. Christ the Messiah. His name means Savior, Matthew 1, 21. And he shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. <coughs> Have you received Jesus Christ as your Savior? Have you received Jesus? Is your attitude towards Jesus Christ that he is God in the flesh that shed his blood on the cross to pay for your sins? Is that your attitude? Have you received him? He came into his own and his own received him not. But as many as received him to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Wow. It doesn't say even to them that go knocking on all the doors in the town. To tell them about me. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say those who be as good as they can be. It doesn't say that. It talks about what it says is um, to those who receive him, believe in him. A Savior is born, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. He came to his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, have you received him? To them give you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. This makes the difference for the, between those who just believe and those who are, are really saved. That's a key verse. You see, even the demons believe who Jesus is. They believe. A lot of people believe who Jesus is. They believe that he existed. That doesn't make him saved. Those people who receive Jesus, Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I can do nothing to get to heaven. I'm born sinner. I'm born 
missing the mark. I can't do anything, Lord. There's nothing I can do. I can't be good enough. I'm already a sinner. I can't do enough things. I can't pay enough money to get to heaven. Lord Jesus, forgive me my sins and save me. Jesus, I believe who you are. I believe that you're God in the flesh. I believe that you shed your blood on the cross for me. Save me, Lord. That's where salvation is at. Calling upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ because of who he is and because of what he's done. You know, I mean, I could call on Buddha. But Buddha didn't shed his blood for me. When I was in Germany, well, I had read about a, a tribe in Africa that used to believe in the big hairy spider. They believed that God was the big hairy spider. And this big hairy spider would save him. And I talk about that. Your salvation is only as good as the object of your belief. If you believe in a big hairy spider, that big hairy spider didn't shed his blood for you. When I got down to Italy, I had a lot of refugees in my church. And there was one of the refugees, well, actually there's two of them, refugees from, from one area in Ghana. And I, and I started talking about this big hairy spider, and it says, yeah, we believe in, uh, our tribe, our people believe in the big hairy spider. That's, that's, that's it. That big hairy spider lives in Ghana. And they believe that he's God. But no big hairy spider ever paid for my sins. But Jesus Christ did. He came to this earth to shed his blood to pay for your sins. That's the reason he came here. So we need to accept God's free gift. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. That's eternal separation from God and the place that's prepared for Satan and his fallen angels. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So the question comes up once again. Are you ready for Christmas? Are you ready for Christmas with the proper attitude? What's your attitude towards Jesus Christ? Are you ready for Christmas? And that you're pure. That your sin is confessed. That Jesus has cleansed you of your sins. Are you ready for Christmas? So let's talk about the sin confessed. Um, his word, the Bible, is given to cleanse us. Ephesians 5, 25 to 27 says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy without blemish. When you trust in, hey, hey, listen. I know, I know who I am. And if you're anything like me, you know that you're not pure. You know that you're not clean. Except that you've been cleansed by Jesus Christ, by his shed blood. There's nothing I can do to cleanse myself. I was born a sinner. Because I was born a sinner, I'm a sinner. I sin. And I've sinned. I try not to. But Linda's been married to me for 52 years now, almost 52 years. And she knows that I'm not exactly perfect. You see, in order to get to heaven, you have to be perfect. And then the only way we can be perfect is to have our sins cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. So, 
His blood cleansed all my past sins. His blood cleansed all the sins that I may do today. When I'm not thinking of God, when I'm doing something without with the Lord in my mind, that's sin. In his shed blood, cleansed all my past, my present, and he cleansed all my future sins. So therefore, I'm pure in the sight of God because I'm covered by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us he wants a purified people in Titus 2.14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all inequity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Well, we ought to be zealous of good works. We ought to be ready to do things good for God, not to get us to heaven. It can't get us to heaven. Only the shed blood can get us to heaven. But once we've been cleansed by the blood, we ought to do things for the Lord. We ought to be doing good works. The Bible says confess, and he will forgive and he'll cleanse us. John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I mean, you don't have to go out and make a list. Lord, I did this at such and such a time. About 30 minutes later, I did this. And then it was only two minutes later, I did this too. You don't need to, Lord God, I know I'm a sinner. Lord, I know I've sinned, and I sin. Jesus, forgive me my sins and save me. Turn to Jesus. That's where salvation is at. But the Bible says, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation, and with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. So I'm talking to this, this young lady here, and I say, um, if you died today, do you think you'd go to heaven? Well, I hope so. I try to be good. The Bible says that all have sinned. It's not a matter of trying to be good. You've already, you've already sinned. Have you asked Jesus? Have you recognized to Jesus the fact that you're a sinner? Jesus, I'm a sinner. Have you, have you told him that you're a sinner? And that you, you know you can't get to heaven on your own. There's nothing you can do to get to heaven. Have you asked Jesus to come into your heart? Did you ask Jesus, Jesus, forgive me. I'm a sinner. And save me, Lord. So are you ready for Christmas? Are your sins confessed? Confess the fact that you're a sinner? How about your thoughts towards others? My thoughts towards others? Matthew 6, 14 through 15. For if we forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven us. Ephesians 4.32 And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Jesus' dying prayer was to forgive. Luke 23.34 Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. Crucified him. The first deacon, Stephen, when he was stoned to death, what he said, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Forgiveness is through his blood, Ephesians 1.7. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. When you pray, you need to forgive. Mark 11, 25, and 26 says, And when ye stand praying, forgive, if ye have aught against any, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. You know, I could stand up here day after day after day, and I've done um, I mean, I've preached numerous times, but my words are, are nothing if the Lord's words are not in it. I mean, I've, I'm giving you a lot 
of Bible, a lot of Bible, verbatim, what the Bible says. Because my words might just help to tie some of it together, but actually what I say is really nothing. It's what the Bible says. You know, I'm not, I've been known to preach. In fact, not too long ago, I did a, uh, I was working on my computer, and it gathered up the messages that I'd preached, that I'd made, uh, that are on that computer. Not all the messages, but all, all the ones that I had on my computer. And it said I had 3,194 messages, maybe 93 messages that I'd made that are on that computer. So, I mean, I've, been, I've done this. I've talked a lot. I've preached a lot. But the only thing that counts is really the Word of God because what I say is, is nothing except that it's the Word of God. When you stand praying, forgive if you have ought against another, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. This is, that's the Word of God. If I said it, it's nothing. But the Lord says it. God who created the earth out of nothing spoke it into existence. He watches over it and takes care of things. Is perfectly capable of giving us his word perfect. Word perfect. And keeping it word perfect down through the ages. He does that. Satan tries to change it. He uses various men, various means of changing words, moving it a little bit here and a little there, taking a little out, adding a little this. But God is able to keep it perfect and intact down through the ages. <clears throat> this house is like a war zone, Fred and Mom. Fussing, arguing, quarreling. Oh, for some peace and quiet, she said. Just then, Amy slammed the door behind her as she came into the room. Now what, Mother asked. Guess who got the part of Mary in the Christmas play? Amy asked sarcastically. Holly, of course. She said she didn't even want it. I'm the reader again. Dad looked up. Isn't Holly your best friend, he asked. Amy curled her lip. She used to be my best friend, she corrected. Scowling, she went to her room. A little later, four-year-old Mindy helped Mother decorate the cookies and practice her song for the Christmas program. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men, she sang. I would do it, but my voice is not. Then she asked, Mommy? Did Mary get Jesus clothes at the Goodwill store? See what I mean? It doesn't work. Mother laughed. No, honey. They didn't have Goodwill Industries in Jesus' time, she said. Mom, said Amy, coming back into the kitchen. When are Aunt Edna and Uncle Carl, Carl coming? Mother frowned. They aren't, she replied shortly. Not coming, cried Amy. Why not? It won't be like Christmas without, without them. When Mother didn't reply, Amy looked at her suspiciously. Haven't you spoke to Aunt Edna since Grandma's funeral, she asked. Are you still mad about that album? I'd rather not discuss it, Mother answered icily. Little Mindy said in, the, in observation, You're mad at Aunt Edna, and Amy's mad at Holly. I don't know who I'm mad at. She went back to practicing her lines. On earth, peace, goodwill toward men. She sang. Mother sighed. On earth, peace, goodwill toward men, she repeated softly. I would use, I could use some peace. She went to the telephone. I'm going to call Aunt Edna. It's still not too late to come through Christmas. Amy smiled. Really? Then I'll call Holly, she decided. Maybe she can come over and help decorate these cookies. Jesus Christ said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let your heart be troubled, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. That's in John chapter 14. So I ask you again, are you ready for Christmas? 
How about your thankfulness? Have you shown your gratitude to God for his perfect gift? Is your gratitude expressed? We need to be thankful. You know, on Okinawa, every year what I would do is I had this song from Pat the Pirate. It was Wally the Whale. Wally the Whale was always talking about um, getting presents. But he, he didn't ever give anything to Jesus. And you know what? Linda and I determined back then that the biggest Christmas gift we'd give each Christmas was the Christmas gift we put in. We had a box that we'd put in front of the church. And it was for the people to give Christmas presents to the Lord. And then after after we tallied it up, it was usually a pretty good, pretty good amount. And we'd decide how we were going to use it for the Lord. Sometimes we'd send it to missionaries or building projects or things like that. But we always determined to give our biggest gift to the Lord. And that's the way we've always done it. First Corinthians 1, 9 through 13 says, God is faithful by whom you are called unto the fellowship of, of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, that, that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it's been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are con contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I am of Paulus, and I am of Cephas, and I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Is Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? John 15, 13. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Jesus has indeed to us in that he left heaven, took on the form of a man, laid down his life for his friends. Trusted in Christ? Do you ha are you ready for Christmas? Do you are you holding something against another? Maybe somebody else in the church here. Are you holding something against maybe somebody at work in your household or maybe a relative or a friend far away? Maybe you ought to get on the phone and get these things taken care of. You need to be ready for Christmas. You need to be right with others. You need to be right with your, with your spouse. You need to be right with your children. You need to be right with your, with your parents. You need to be right with your friends. You definitely need to be right with others in the church. Is there anything between the two of you? Or between you and somebody else? Or others? Are you ready for Christmas? First off, you need to be saved. If you've not trusted in Christ, you're not ready for Christmas. You're not ready for anything. You're definitely not ready for eternity in heaven. This Christmas is celebrated by giving gifts. Christ gave the greatest, the most expensive gift, and that's the gift that cost him everything. Hebrews chapter 10 says, Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it's written of me, to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering have burnt, and burnt offerings and offerings for sin, thou wouldest not. Neither had his pleasure therein. Neither had his pleasure therein, which were offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which, where we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. 
And every priest standeth daily, ministering and offering oft times the same sacrifice, which can never take away sin. And there's priests and so-called holy men the world over offering sacrifices and doing oblations and things, and none of that can take away sin. Can never take away sin. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, he sat down at the right hand of God. Jesus Christ did it. The only perfect one shed his blood. You know, Jesus is the reason for the season. The wise men gave, Matthew 2, 1 through 11. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. They weren't kings. When we sing Christmas Eve night, we're going to sing, We wise men of Orient are bearing gifts. We've traveled afar. We're not going to be singing, We three kings. They weren't kings. The Bible says we are wise men, so we're going to sing wise men. There came men from the east of Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled on all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, and thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, art not the least among the princes of Judea. For out of thee shall come a, a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when you found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. Yeah, that's going to happen. When they heard the king, they parted, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And they, when they were come to the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasure, they presented unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And in Daniel 1, 3-4, And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of the, his eunuchs, and he should bring forth of the children of Israel, and of the king's seed, and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well-favored, and skillful in all wisdom, and cunning, and knowledge, and understanding science, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace. And when they might teach the learning in the tongue of the Chaldeans. And then in Daniel 4, 4 through 9, it says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was the rest of mine house and flourishing in my palace. And I saw a dream which made me afraid, and the thoughts upon my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. Therefore made I a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me, that they might make known unto me the interpretation of the dream. Then came the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers, and I told them the dream before me, and they did not make known unto me the interpretation thereof. But at the last Daniel came in before me, whose name is Belteshazzar, Belteshazzar, uh, according to the name of my God, and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And before him I told the dream, saying, O Belteshazzar, master of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of Holy God is in thee, and no secret troubleth thee. Troubleth thee. Tell me the visions of my dream that I have seen in the interpretation thereof. And then in Luke chapter 2, when Christ was born, and the shepherds returned, glorifying, praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. And Simeon blessed God because he saw the Jesus Christ the Savior. Paul gave thanks in 2 Corinthians. Thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift. Wow! His unspeakable gift. Now I ask you again, 
Are you ready for Christmas? I mean, it was told that Christ was coming in foreign lands. The wise men that came from the east were expecting him ever since Daniel was there with Nebuchadnezzar. And they were looking forward to this. And then it was revealed to them, and they followed the star. And those wise men came in search of the one who was born to take away the sins of the world. Are you in search of the one who came to take away the sins of the world? Are you ready for Christmas? Have you got things sorted out in your life? Have you got things sorted out between you and other folks? Remember, the greatest gift was the gift that Jesus Christ gave. Are you ready for Christmas? If you died today, do you know what would happen to you? Have you trusted in Jesus Christ for eternal salvation? I mean, he's, he's the one that gave the gift. I think we should give gifts also. And you know what? The whole world does it. I mean, here, here we are in Japan. Christmas is big. Now, it's commercial. Most of them don't know who Jesus is. But nevertheless, because Jesus came to this earth and shed his blood to give us eternal salvation, even his birth is, is celebrated here in Japan. Some people know. Some know. Do you know? Are you ready? Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, I come to you now.